Welcome, uh, dear students, uh, colleagues, and uh, young intensivists, wherever you are, to this very special session of our webinars in critical care. So today we have a very special guest, uh, Professor Siterio. Sir is uh, known to all of you. He is the editor-in-chief of our very popular and leading journal in intensive care, the Intensive Care Medicine Journal. Sir has been the editor for the last five years and it has grown to great heights uh, under his editorship. So we thank you, sir, for providing us this wonderful journal and its contents. And uh, moving on, sir is the anesthesia and intensive care professor at the Milano Biococca University, Italy. Sir is the director of the neuroscience department and director of anesthesia and neurosurgical intensive care at St. Gerardo Hospital AST Monza. And Sir has uh, co-edited the Oxford textbook of neurocritical care, and he has a large number of publications, around 500 to his credit. Sir is one of the luminaries in neurointensive care, and we have learned much from his research. Thank you, Sir. Thank you for all your work and contributions to neurointensive care, and thank you for sparing your time and teaching us today. Over to you, Sir. Thank you very much. Uh the passion for your kind introduction. And uh, the topic today will be to discuss about ICP monitoring. And this is the agenda of a talk. After a short introduction on physiopathology, we will discuss how to measure intracranial hypertension. And then we will go in deeper detail on indication of uh, ICP monitoring. And we present, we will discuss uh, the possibility to understand and to have a better idea of the conundrum of uh, uh, inserting a device uh, measuring ICP, if it's worth or not, and then we will go in the direction of the conclusion. Since the beginning, I would suggest you to take a look at this paper. As you see in the slide, there is a, a link for a free read uh, possibility, even if you don't have the access to the journal through your library. This is a free link for reading the article on intracranial pressure we published uh, in 2022. So it is available and many of the information we will discuss today are uh, present in this paper. We are going to discuss about monitoring ICP and every time we discuss about uh, measuring, monitoring something continuously, uh, we do it in intensive care because we set some alarms. And when we have uh, the parameter going outside the alarms, higher or lower, we start think about uh, reacting. And uh, we will see that also the problem of the threshold is a problem still open. And then uh, when we, are, uh, let's say, alerted by an alarm, we start thinking about adapting our patient care plan for improving, try to reduce the burden of uh, a secondary insult for improving recovery of the patient. So this is the, uh, let's say, scenario in which we are moving and thinking about intracranial pressure along with the other possible uh, monitor system that we can use in neurocritical care, intracranial pressure measure only intracranial volumes and the equilibrium of the changes of intracranial volume and uh, uh, the, the, the pressure that this uh, volume produce inside the skull. And we think about, if we think about physiopathology, we have a closed environment and more Kelly described it more than uh, 2,000 years ago, 200 years ago. And you can see there is a, a volume of 1.5 liters, around 1.5 liters, in which we have a brain tissue, CS CSF, and intravascular volume. But in normal condition, produce a pressure in adults around uh, uh, 10 or lower than 10 millimeters of mercury. And it depends if you are flat or upstanding, the, the pressure could be different because if you stand up, your pressure goes down, became around the, uh, the atmospheric pressure. And every time we want to measure for any uh, reason, and we will discuss the reason and why, uh, intracranial pressure, we will see a waveform that is uh, described by different uh, 
uh, component, and we will go in deeper detail in a while, but this uh, uh, waveform describe the position of the patient on the pressure volume curve. Usually, a normal subject stay on the flat part of the pressure volume curves. And every time that uh, the blood comes inside the skull for uh, an heartbeat, uh, a cardiac uh, systole, you can see there is, uh, in the MRI represented on the right slide of the slide, there is a movement, compensatory movement of the CSF, allowing the entrance of the cerebral blood flow inside the skull. This is the normal physiology. The blood comes inside the skull, 15% of the cardiac output. Some CSF is moved outside, and in diastole, it returns back inside the skull. So this allows some volume entering every heartbeat in the skull. But when we have an extra volume here uh, represented in uh, uh, like uh, edema or other lesion, you can see that uh, in the same compartment, we have an additional volume that produces, for example, compression of the lateral ventricle. So a reduction of this compensatory mechanism. We are discussing about intracranial pressure. And if you think about the condition that produce an increase of volume inside the skull, there are conditions in which there is a fluid accumulation in the tissue. So we are talking about, talking about edema, cytotoxic or vagusenic edema, depending on the cause, opening of the blood-brain barrier, vasogenic edema, or energetic problem, cytotoxic edema. We can think about uh, increase of the volume inside the vessel. So changes of the diameter of the vessel due to hypertension or hypotension, hypercapnia, or obstruction of the venous return, like a sinus thrombosis. We can have an increase of volume with uh, uh, increase of CSF, so hydrocephalus, due to an obstruction of the outflow from the lateral ventricle or a disturbance or reabsorption in the subarachnoid space of the CSF. And we can have also, in trauma mainly, extravascular blood accumulation like sub subdural, extradural hematoma, intraparenchinal hemorrhage, and so on. In all of these conditions, we need to think about the possibility that the intracranial pressure is going up. And if we return back to the cartoon, starting from a normal condition, adding an extra volume here in gray, we have a movement right side of the uh, position of the patient on the pressure volume curve. At the beginning of the movement rightward, we don't have an increase of intracranial pressure because the volume is compensated by the reduction of the ventricles. So the buffering system, the ventri lateral ventricles, allow to have some extra volume inside the skull without a reduction of any high intracranial pressure. But when this mechanism is exhausted, so the ventricles are squeezed, there are not so much CSF in the ventricle, small changes in volumes will produce changes in pressure, high changes in pressure. So you can see the pressure volume curves with the arrow moving rightward. So small changes of volume produce high changes of uh, pressure because there is no more compensatory elements inside the, inside the skull. And if you look at the CT scan, it's the easiest way for understanding if there is some disturbances in the intracranial volume. As you can see in the upper part, we have a normal ICP situation in, in which we can see the peri uh, cisternal uh, compartment uh, and the lateral ventricles. When a patient have an ICP, according to his age, the volume of the ventricle became reduced, squeezed, and we can have also midline shift like in the presence of hematoma. So looking at the CT scan, that is one of the elements we consider when we insert an ICP, we can have an idea if the patient have or doesn't have any problem. And returning back to the waveform, also the waveform is influenced by the changes in volume. As you can see in the upper part is the normal intracranial pressure waveform in which this is P1 is the systolic part of the curve, the arrival of the blood flow inside the skull. P2 is lower because of the movement of a CSF from the ventricle outside the skull. 
So there is the possibility to accept the volume coming is inside the skull because we move outside the skull some volume, the CSF. In the lower part of this cartoon, when the pressure volume curve moves rightward, so there is a decompensation of the system, when there is an increase of volume every heartbeat, P2 is higher than P1 because of the loss of the compensatory mechanism. So the extra volume produce an increase, extra volume in intravascular compartment produce an increase of intracranial pressure because there is no more compensatory mechanism. So also the intracranial pressure give us an information about the, if the system is closed, information about the compensatory mechanism of the system. Why we care about intracranial pressure? We care about intracranial pressure mainly for two category of problem. The first one is the one we are thinking more often, herniation. So the extra volume inside the skull produce some gradient, pressure gradient inside the compartment. And we are very worried about uh, this uh, compression, the uncal compression of the brainstem because the patient is going to die for the compression of the brainstem and for the ischemia of the brainstem, brainstem. But also we have tonsillar herniation that compress the medullary uh, part of the brain. And we have also subfalcing uh, herniation. So all these herniation give us information about the gradient of pressure. And we are very worried about uh, the compression of the brainstem. But on the other side, every time we increase intracranial pressure, we have an obstruction of the cerebral blood flow. So the risk of having high intracranial pressure for a long time, and we will discuss about those of ICP in a while, is the impact that high ICP produce on the cerebral blood flow because increased ICP reduce the cerebral blood flow. And inside that, we have two points now to discuss, how to measure and, and to evaluate intracranial pressure and which are the indication of uh, inserting or evaluating ICP non-invasively. The gold standard today is an invasive monitoring. Uh, usually we discuss in the past that the gold standard is the ventricular catheter, but uh, the ventricular catheter have a lot of problems of calibration and so on, and also intraparenchymal device could be seen today as uh, the gold standard of measuring ICP. Both of them, intraventricular and intraparenchymal, all of, all, both of them have some problems we will see in a while. And so we can say that accuracy of intraparenchymal or ventricular catheter is very high. Ventricular catheter that are more indicated in situations like subarachnoid hemorrhage in which there is blood inside the ventricle most of the time. And the medium rate of infection, that means that we have a rate of infection for 1,000 1, days of monitoring around seven, seven, 10, 10 days of infection every 1,000 days of monitoring in, in, in the best uh, institution. We have a very low rate of hemorrhage, less than 2%. There is some hemorrhagic uh, bleeding around the catheter. Most of them doesn't need any surgery. And we have the problem of cost in which intraparenchymal catheter have an higher cost compared to a ventricular catheter but it has a medium cost, but both of them have a, a, an economical cost. And in the uh, Neurocritical Care Society uh, consensus on monitoring, we say that the indication comes from the Brain Trauma Foundation Guidance, and you can see they are cancer, and we've seen why, why they are cancer. But I think in all the situation where we suspect an elevated ICP by clinical evaluation and by the CT scan, we need to think about the possibility to evaluate an ICP to monitor ICP. And usually we insert the catheter when it's a parenchymal or ventricular catheter through the frontal lobe. And uh, there is a suggestion to use the same side of the lesion for appreciating better appreciation of the gradients inside the skull. And we said that both intraventricular and parenchymal device are uh, the way commonly used for uh, measuring ICP. And there are some uh, information on zeroing 
and timing will be seen in a while when we will discuss about the intraventricular catheter that uh, as soon as possible is the best for inserting an ICP. If we have an indication, don't wait, don't wait time, insert an ICP. And the duration is the duration of suspected elevated ICP. So if you record it, you need a certain times in which ICP return back to normality before the removal of the uh, catheter. And so we want to see the, the waveform for the reason I presented earlier about the waveform of the ICP. And we want a continu continuous waveform display in the monitor so we can see every heartbeat how the situation is. We need to have for ba balancing uh, risk and benefit a normal coagulation and usually we use also pre-insertion antibiotic prophylactic when we insert the catheter and we will discuss later on about the, the threshold. And uh, in the consensus of an neurocritical care society and the European Society of Intensive Care, we suggested that uh, uh, both uh, intraparenchymal uh, and ventricular catheter are accurated for measuring ICP. And uh, is, they are a prerequisite for inserting other device. N now comes also the possibility and the idea to be more kind and to be less invasive because in some center, these catheters are not available. In some patient, we have a coagulopathy and so inserting a catheter could be worrisome. And we have some uh, gray area situation in which we are not sure to insert the uh, invasive catheter. So we are starting thing to be uh, less uh, invasive with non-invasive device. But thinking about non-invasive device, we need to compare them to the invasive device we discussed earlier. And so we need to think that both intraparenchymal and ventricular catheter are our gold standard today. Because they are accurate, they give us continuous information and they have some problem. They need to, to pass through the parenchyma, uh, to the parenchyma. And so a non-invasive is uh, Usually, we think that more than one device and a consensus that is going to be developed in the next uh, few months uh, would say that uh, we cannot rely on a single tool. So we need to think about composing the information coming from uh, more than one tool because they are not as accurate as we would like to have them accurate. So they are not so precise as we want, and they give us some snapshot information. They are not continuous, and sometimes for some of them, they are operator dependent. And so looking at them, there is a recent meta-analysis published on the BMJ that says that 30 study, uh, other patient, uh, physical exam, imaging, non-invasive test, comparator is invasive ICP monitoring. And as you can see, looking at the result, the uh, specificity and sensitivity for most of them, CT scan and clinical exam is not so good for giving us the information they are, that the ICP is high. For example, if you look at midline shift, IGA, uh, basal system, uh, absent or compressed, they give us your sensitivity and specificity moderate. So we use other means. The easiest way is to measure the optic nerve shift diameter with an echo machine. As you can see in the, in the uh, MRI here, we are measuring three millimeters uh, be, behind the globe of the eye, the diameter of the optic nerve shift. Because uh, if you look in the cartoon, when we have an increase of ICP, we have a movement of the CSF from the ventricle outside the skull, but also through the optic nerve shift. And as you can see, there is a dilatation of the bulbar part of the optic nerve shift. And as you can see, comparing the two, the two cartoons, there is an increase of the diameter that we can appreciate uh, by echography. And it's very easy to be done with some characteristics. We suggest to use the two two axes for evaluating it. And the other suggestion is to use also uh, the evaluation of the vascular uh, component for avoiding artifact due to mainly to vein around 
biotic now. But is a good correlation between the CT scan and MRI uh, with the ICP measure with the optic neck shift diameter. But as you can see, there is a huge distribution of the, of the values because if the ICP is around, let's say, optic neck shift diameter is seven, we can have an ICP that could be normal and abnormal. And my suggestion is to look at the trend in the single patient, even if we, when we're looking in risk meta-analysis, sensitivity and specificity of very high value, higher than uh, five millimeters 0.4, they are associated with high specificity and sensitivity of having an ICP. And in this meta-analysis, the same concept return back. So my suggestion for optic neck shift diameter that could be easily learned by young doctors is that some training is required for having a value need to have a movement of a CSF. And the most important suggestion is not to rely on a single value, but taking a look at the trend over time of the distension of the optic neck shift diameter that suggests that as an and worsening situation. And it's not reliable in SIH patient because during the bleeding, there is a dilatation, you dilatation of the optic nerve that doesn't return back to normality. And take a look at the artifact. In some country like France, there is a lot of emphasis, a lot of use of uh, transcranial Doppler TCD. And as you can see, there is some rational uh, uh, use because when ICP goes up, the pulsation, the pulse, pulse of the flow velocity became steeper. There is an increase of the pulse, lower diastolic, higher systolic, and the information could be uh, deduced of a, a not compensated situation. But when you look at the uh, rock curve sensitivity specificity in many studies about transcranial Doppler, as you can see, TCD is not reliable to measure and estimate ICP. And in a recent Italian study by Frank Razzullo, you can see here the Blande Altman, the Doppler, transcranial Doppler, apply some formula described by Chosnika for calculating CPP and extracting ICP is not so accurate looking at the Blande Altman for estimating ICP. So we don't suggest to measure ICP using a TCD. So we have uh, in this scenario the possibility to insert a catheter to estimate, not measure, ICP, mainly with optic snap shift diameter and sometimes with TCD looking at the changes of the waveform over time. But both, both of them are not continuous. Both of them have a lot of pitfalls and could you, in our setting, they are using borderline situation. But in which patient, male in trauma patient, we want to measure ICP? And I think the problem in trauma, in SIH, in other conditions that we don't have clear indication in the guidelines and for Trauma Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines. And uh, there are no randomized control trial that documented utility of ICP monitoring. So a better outcome in a randomized control trial. And so the question for the clinician sometimes is worth measuring ICP? And if we refer to the only randomized controlled trial with 120 patients, each group uh, uh, run by Randy Chestnut in uh, South America, he randomized two group of patients. In one uh, pressure ICP was measured and ICP guided the therapy. The other was not an observation study. It was a, a study in which a therapy has been applied looking at clinics and looking at the clinical and uh, neuroradiological exam. The first information in this study is the blue group, the group uh, guided by imaging, not by ICP, received much more therapy than the group in which the therapy was guided by the monitoring because probably some patients were exposed to therapy even if it was not needed, only from the clinical exam and uh, the CT scan. But uh, the, neg the, the trial is uh, judged as a negative study because uh, in 157 patients in each group, in, in under 60 patients, uh, the outcome that was a composite uh, 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 score that is not clinically 
uh, used now, but having so small number of patients, they need to find something for that, do some statistical analysis. They said there is no difference having uh, the, a situation in which the patient is treated guided by the ICP or guided by clinics and neuroradiology. But I would like to suggest you to take a look at favorable outcome and death. There is a difference of 5% in the two groups with the benefit of a patient with an ICP monitoring. And we, when we started to, to run a randomized control trial with pharmacological therapy, the target we have is to improve mortality and disability by 5%. And in, in this negative study, there is a signal that the patient with an ICP monitoring went better even if they don't reach a statistical significance in this study, but they went better. And if we return back to the guidelines, we say that in 2017, uh, we, we don't have any strong evidence for supporting, because we don't have a randomized control trial, supporting the insertion of an ICP device, even if we say we have a lower certainty that uh, severe patient could be a better treater using information coming from an ICP monitoring. So it's recommended to reduce hospital and two weeks mortality. So don't have in a randomized control trial because it's negative randomized control trial, but it wasn't a trial in which we tested, can ICP work? Because there were two treatment compared one with, with, the, with the other. We start to think about to use information coming from pragmatic trial, large observational study, and so the so-called comparative effectiveness research that looks at, uh, like uh, the difference in outcome related to different behavior, behaviors. And uh, we have different possibility to do comparative effectiveness. We did it in, in Center TBI, in which uh, we have a lot of uh, information by, on by big data, routinely collect data, we try to stratify patient producing a better precision medicine with biomarker, and we did a lot of analysis of large data. And so looking at the possibility to use comparative effectiveness for understanding if uh, ICP is worth uh, monitoring, I, I will try to answer the three questions. Is uh, ICP monitoring associated with better outcome using comparative effectiveness research? There is indication for ICP in TBI and which is the threshold treatment. So starting for the first question, if the better outcome is documented with comparative effectiveness research, I would refer to this last study we coordinated a couple of years ago that is published on uh, Lancet Neurology in 2021. We enrolled around 2,000 and some hundred patients in which we wanted to understand if uh, uh, there is a benefit or there is a, an associated benefit uh, having an ICP monitoring. So 2,394 patients, half of them had uh, an ICP device. Uh, the other 44% wasn't monitoring. Most of them were trauma. And uh, what we saw that uh, in the blue part of this cartoon, like in the black part, black part is center TBI, blue part is synapse ICU. There is a huge variability between the center in inserting an ECP device for the same patient characteristic. And this variation is minus two plus two. So means that around there is five times variation in the uh, propensity to insert an ICP device in the same situation. So some center are more prone to insert a device, some center are less prone to insert a device. But when you have a device, ICP monitoring during the first week, and I will not go in detail until till I therapy intensive level, you are more aggressive uh, treating the patient. It's the different difference, main difference with the trial from, from Randy Chestnut, in which the patient without ICP received more therapy. In real life, the patient with an ICP device received more target therapy for ICP. And if we look at the association between ICP monitoring and outcome. Globally speaking, we cannot see a clear association with patients with both pupils reactive, but with a patient more severe, with at least one pupil reactive, we have a very strong 
positive effect of having an ICP device for reducing six-month mortality and for improving uh, better outcome at six months. And this remains also removing the patient that are going to die in the early phase, in the early 38 hours. So it's a strong message. It is a strong signal that on 2,000 patients, the more severe patient have a benefit of having an ICP. We discuss uh, the possibility of having an external ventricular drainage or intraparenchymal drainage. There is no difference using comparative effectiveness of better outcome in TBI using one of the other device. There is a little bit longer stay in the ICU with a ventricular catheter and we have a more possibility of an hematoma around the catheter. But the message coming from center TBI and from track TBI here says that uh, if you need to insert a catheter, there is a better association, association with better outcome if you insert earlier in the first 24 hours after the trauma. And which are the indications we can extract from comparative effectiveness? If you look at the first trial on ICP it was published in 1982, most of you were not born at that time. And uh, with first generation CT scan, Narayan said that uh, you need to have a mass lesion and coma for inserting an ICP. And uh, in the first three edition of the guidelines, the positive CT scan and coma were indication for inserting an ICP. But nowadays, there is no randomized controlled trial and the standard for producing evidence are high. And we can say that we don't have so sufficient evidence in randomized controlled trial for defining, defining the subpopulation. But in center TBI, these are different population, trauma, SIH, and intracranial hemorrhage. We still have the signal that in more severe patients in trauma, we have a benefit. In SIH and in intraparenchymal hemorrhage, we have a signal even if the patient doesn't have a, a very severe clinical picture. So we also, we both reactive pupil. So putting together this information, we probably have a senior from comparative effectiveness of the benefit. And we try to do other approach, uh, uh, invest probability, instrumental variable approach uh, for documenting it. And we put together many other data sets. We are doing the same analysis with center TBI and track TBI. And in all of them, using comparative effectiveness uh, research, we continuously and constantly have the senior that there is a benefit of measuring and treating ICP. Randy Chestnut, the author that did run the randomized control trial, did ask to around 30 colleagues, uh, which are the indication that today the experts are using best side for inserting an ICP. And if you look at uh, the right part of this cartoon, and looking at the Glasgow Coma Score, Marshall CT scan is the classification of the severity of CT scan. In red is uh, the situation in which don't insert a monitor. In green or dark green is a situation in which we insert a monitor. And in yellow is a situation, let us say, unclear. The green part of this cartoon said that we have, when we have a patient in a coma with a positive CT scan, the suggestion of being invasive and insert an ICP is quite strong, according to the expert. And uh, the other point is, uh, we didn't touch this point till now, and then we, when we insert the catheter, and we said that inserting a catheter, measuring a parameter, in this case ICP, could be useful for the patient only if we integrate this information in the clinical pathway, in the treatment pathway of the patient, and we need to define which is, which is the threshold for treating ICP. And I think in medicine, we learn that we don't have a fixed threshold for everything. Think about the arterial pressure. You don't start thinking about hypotension when patients have 59 millimeters of mercury because in your mind, 60 millimeters of mercury systolic is a very low arterial pressure. When the patient goes below 100, you start be agitated. If the patient goes to 90, you start being more agitated. At 70, you have a very severe problem in an adult patient in intensive care of systolic arterial pressure. So you don't have a single number. And we did a, an error in, a, in a neurocritical care because we define a single threshold. But if we return back to the history, 
1965, the first uh, doctor of measuring ICP, he said that ICP of 10 is normal, above 15 is uh, slightly elevated, 25 is moderately elevated, and uh, above 40 is a very high ICP. And he started to think about uh, the disturbances of the compartment. Uh, Douglas Miller presented the distribution of ICP and uh, he looked at the effect of any very high ICP. And in situation with or without intracranial mass lesion, he divided the patient according to the ICP. And he was looking at uh, if the patient in group three was uh, higher than 20, not control, in the group two, till 20, but control, he defined two situation in which uh, there is an increase of ICP, but we are able to control it, and there is an increase in ICP, and we are not able to control. And the threshold was 20 at this stage, and we saw that the patient with a higher ICP, I gave them 20, without a response to therapy, they had a more negative outcome. But the discussion continued because having two threshold, 15 or 20, was associated in large population with a better result of 20, 15 compared to 20. So. Try to control the ICP, putting ICP in the direction of normality has been associated with better outcome. But the study that did change the way we think IC, we, we think the threshold of ICP is this uh, study from the traumatic coma data band with Tony Marmaru. And he presented this result that said the probability of having a negative outcome, in this case, the red bar, increase on the percentage of time spent over the threshold. So the elements are two here, a threshold and time. And the problem is that we are so simple mind that we translate in the guideline this concept wrongly. And we say, Barmaru say that beyond age, admission motor score, pupils, and the, pro the proportion of time of ICP I given 20 is indicative of outcome. The guidelines in our simplistic mind, in our unit is to put the threshold at 20 and say 20 is the threshold for starting the therapy. And the Brain Trauma Foundation till the third edition of the guidelines say that the treatment should be initiated when ICP goes over 20 with a level two uh, evidence. But as you see from the story, Tony Malmaro didn't say that. Say that you need to take care of two elements the value and the time of exposure, like other parameters, like the arterial pressure we discussed earlier. Then this study comes from Cambridge and that was looking at this association, better association of ICP and outcome. And unfortunately, the guidelines using this information did change the threshold and they suggested, the silly suggestion is not a wise move, that the ICP need to be treated when it's not 20, but 22. And I think it's a very stupid situation because it doesn't reflect the reality. It doesn't reflect the information coming from, uh, from Tony Marmor. So what we understood from the study along uh, in parallel with the guidelines, this study come from Seattle. And so if you look at the exposure of the patient at different level of ICP, in black is higher than 25, in blue is less than 10, in green 10, 14, 15, 19, 20, 24. As you can see, there is not a single value that differentiates mortality. It's a continuous, more exposed the patient, more probable, probable, probably is the uh, negative outcome, the mortality of the patient. So even very low intracranial pressure could have a mortality. And they, I think we need to think about when you measure ICP about the value and the duration of the exposure. And here comes the concept of dose. That means that we can calculate the area under the curve over time in which we calculate the time of exposure and the intensity of exposure of ICP. And you can see that the patient with no dose of ICP, no exposure, have a better outcome compared to the patient with a high dose or moderate dose of ICP. We replicate the, this concept that we can study in trauma also in subarachnoid hemorrhage and in other settings. And in center TBI, Cecilia Ackerlund was able to demonstrate looking at the dose of ICP that uh, 
the different outcome according to the Glasgow Coma Scale, one is mortality, are related to the exposure of ICP and time, because this is the pressure time dose, time of exposure. And according to having or not having a good autoregulation, the patient with a, the same exposure without our autoregulation have a worse outcome compared to the other. So for this reason, we suggested to a company to insert in the monitoring system the possibility to calculate the dose of ICP. And so we are doing a study now that a look at the exposure of ICP calculated as dose, and we are looking if the dose is related to outcome and if we are able to evaluate and estimate a, a dose of ICP that could be accepted by the patient. Another way for looking at this problem has been developed by a co uh, uh, with a Brian Eat collaboration in which we participated with a Leuven group. In the Leuven group uh, in 2060 patients, these are in the right part are children. There is this black line, there is a transition between a good outcome in blue and red is a negative outcome. As you can see, this transition is not a line around 20 millimeters of mercury, but even lower value of ICP, if the exposure, the duration of insult is much higher, are associated with a red area, with a negative outcome. So we need to think, start thinking about that we don't have a fixed structure, it's not 20, but it is the value and the time of exposure that are important. And you can see the same in children. And uh, in, sensitive, in, in brain IT collaboration, we saw these two curves in the patient with a normal or impaired autoregulation. And if a patient is not able to have a normal pressure autoregulation, sorry for the movement of the slide, you can see that the transition, transition line, the black line, uh, appears to at, at lower ICP level. So it's important to understand if a patient doesn't have or have an autoregulation. The same applied, this is the same study replicated on a, a group of patients in Cambridge. As you can see, the concept in the same as the image is the same. And we did the same in center TBI, so other population. And as you can see, the curve is similar, is all the same story. And we did also in a, in a SIH patient and we and we found out the regulation. So in going to the conclusion of this talk, I will say to you that uh, uh, we have a lot of discussion in uh, critical care in, uh, in the neurosurgical world, if it's worth measuring ICP or not, and we don't have any randomized control trial because it's not ethical today in the country in which ICP becomes a, is a standard of care to uh, not insert a catheter in a patient with an indication. So we need to use other means for understanding if having or not having an ICP is beneficial and so comparative effectiveness would help us. And the comparative effectiveness uh, give us information that ICP uh, monitoring and treatment are associated with better outcome if we select the patient and we monitor the patient. And we are sure in many settings and uh, that this is true. So there is an elevated grade of certainty that I'm measuring and treating ICP is important for the destiny, for the outcome of our patient. And as we documented in uh, the Synapse ICU, the patient more severe with a very high ICP have also a more aggressive therapy according to the monitoring system. So therapy is a key component of this benefit of having an ICP because measuring without doing anything will not change the outcome of a patient. And if we need to select a subpopulation, we have not so many catheter and we have to select the patient for inserting an ICP, probably the more severe patient are the patient that most benefit of having a device inserted in a treatment of ICP. In borderline situation, probably we can use also non-invasive method because even if they have some pitfalls, they could give us some direction and some trends of the patient. And the other important point is that uh, 
we would like to have a single value, a single treatment value, a single alarm value, but I think there is no a single value, but we need to think about the exposure of the patient. I'm not happy to have a patient in 19 millimeters of mercury all day long, because I think it's more severe of a patient having 25 or 30 millimeters of mercury during nursing for uh, five or 10 minutes. So it's a situation that is more, let's say, severe compared to the other. So going to the conclusion of my talk, and probably we can have time for questions, if any. I think that we discussed about SCP monitoring, and uh, as you understood, we don't have guidelines for defining the population. We deal mainly with trauma, but we can also discuss other situations in the discussion if we want. And I think that new evidence is needed, even if in trauma in the Western country, we cannot randomize the patient having an ICP. And in my, I'm quite old, in my experience, I think that we discuss only in, in our clinic around if we have to insert or doesn't, don't insert a catheter. I think you need to consider it when you see a positive CT scan with an increase in intracranial volume, the use of compensatory mechanism, and a clinical situation of a patient in a coma. I explained to you deeply that the threshold are not a single number, and uh, my suggestion today is to think about the exposure of ICP, so the dose concept, even if we are still working on the dose concept with studies and trying to understand if there is an acceptable dose for the patient. And uh, we didn't touch uh, this point, but I think uh, when we have uh, uh, an increase uh, uh, intracranial pressure because there is an increase of volume, I think we need to use uh, uh, a treatment. And the treatment, I would refer for the treatment, the Seattle consensus we published on intensive care is uh, uh, an open access paper. They give us use a staircase approach to controlling ICP. Thank you for your attention, and I would like, uh, would like to ask uh, Papesh if there is any question or uh, or uh, any other request from your side. Thanks, thanks so much, so much, sir. Professor Sutelio, sir, wonderful talk, and uh, really a lot of learnings from that. And uh, I would just like to uh, ask the audience to put up any questions, if they have. Meanwhile, sir, maybe I can just uh, put up a few questions for discussion for everybody. So you mentioned about Lundberg's waves or A wave and uh, the other waves. And I think that the physiology of A waves and C waves is clear, but B waves is a little controversial. Could you talk a little about B waves, sir? I, I didn't I didn't got your point, sorry. Sir, could you talk about uh, B waves? B waves, Lundberg's B waves. B waves? Yeah. We have the A waves oh. and the C waves, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, Lundberg described this wave, and uh, if, if you refer to B waves, are uh, an example on exhaustion of a compensatory mechanism because are due to massive vasodilatation inside the, uh, the skull. And so we have a very important rise of ICP that touch 50 millimeters of mercury, even 30 50, till 50 millimeters of mercury for a prolonged time is a, is a signal of loss of autoregulation in the more severe patient. If uh, I have to tell you that uh, compared to the past in which uh, we saw often uh, these uh, B waves, you see them uh, mainly as a terminal event is in more severe patient because with the approach we have uh, for the concept of those we have, we try to keep the patient with an ICP on the side lower than 20. And so we don't wait till the patient goes up and in the pressure volume curve, small changes of volume will produce an increase of intracranial pressure and B wave. So I think we are less conservative today, accepting borderline value of ICP and we are more aggressive with therapy. So the patient, um, except in terminal phase is no more exposed to the uh, right ward uh, movement on the pressure volume curve, except if it's very severe and is going to die. And so we don't see so much B waves today. 
Thank you, sir. So then uh, about uh, intubation in these patients with raised ICD, are there any preferred anesthetic agents or we go about it in the usual way? Uh, I got your point about intubation. Yeah, intubation, any preferred anesthetic agents, sir? Or do oh, we... okay. No, oh, I, I think usually our patient in the emergency department or outside the hospital they are intubated with a bowl of propofol and uh, uh, muscular blockers. And, uh, and, and I think uh, there is no preferred agent except in patients with hypotension in which we prefer ketamine. But uh, usually this kind of patient are uh, treated with a bolus of propofol and uh, with uh, a, 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 a fast intubation. Thank you, sir. So then talking about hypotension, you know, literature mentions and we often use phenylephrine. So is it really helpful to use phenylephrine or we can use uh, norepinephrine also uh, equally well? Yeah, in our country for increasing CPP, for keeping the pressure, we are using, we are using usually noradrenaline because we want to increase uh, the mean arterial pressure because the uh, cerebral perfusion pressure we didn't discuss is the difference between at mean arterial pressure and ICP. So for obtaining a better perfusion, we, we want to increase the uh, mean arterial pressure and the usual uh, vasoactive drug we are using in our unit is not adrenaline. Okay. Thank you, sir. So then, uh, you know, if you have a herniation, transtendorial herniation, and uh, if you give a, 20, a bolus of 23% uh, hypotonic saline and, uh, you know, rapidly raise the serum sodium concentration. Is it true that the herniation can reverse? Yeah, when we have a herniation, we need to do something very soon. And so the way we are acting is uh, short-term microventilation and a bolus of osmotic. You can use uh, hypertonic saline with the concentration you prefer. You can use a, a large bolus of mannitol. And uh, both of them could uh, reduce the intracranial volume and revert uh, the uh, herniation and the pupillary dilatation. So it's a, it's a medical emergency in which you need to, to, to reduce the intracranial volume with two means. You have very easy to use the side are osmotics and hyperventilation. So for reducing herniation, we usually do both. Thank you, sir. So I think, sir, one final question. Uh, any preferred mode uh, of ventilation, sir, for... Uh, patients with increased ICT, or we just carry it out in the same fashion? Ventilation. For patient uh, with uh, IICP, we need to, uh, let's say, titrate uh, the CO2. So mechanical ventilation is mandatory, not spontaneous ventilation, and with a, a fine tuning of the CO2. And in our setting, as in many other uh, centers in Europe, we reduce uh, CO2 according to the ICP because even if the effect is not long lasting, reducing ICP give, give us some possibility of uh, uh, reduce ICP. Uh, on the same, the same side, we keep uh, PEEP because there is not so much interference between PEEP and, uh, and uh, intracranial pressure. We use uh, low volume protective ventilation and we increase the frequency uh, of the ventilation for reducing CO2 will not increase the volume uh, insufflated every tidal volume. And so we, we optimize the ventilation for mainly for keeping normoxia and for reducing CO2. Great. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think that is all. So uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, we really obliged and privileged to hear from you. And uh, such a lovely talk and really updated. I'm sure all the audience would have loved it. Any any message you want to give to the young audience, sir, before we close? No, take care of the patient. The most severe patient, if treated very well, could go, would have a, a good outcome. So think about uh, uh, monitoring the evolution of the intracranial volume because controlling them could improve the outcome of your patient. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, sir. Thank you very much. Ciao, ciao.